All right, welcome to Bible class. We're continuing the Sermon on the Mount. We are looking at Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30. Continuing, just kind of go little sections by sections. Here as Jesus does it today, uh, the topic is what Jesus has to say about adultery and lust. All right, so um, it's a sensitive topic. It's kind of, this is one when you're teaching confirmation, you get to this commandment, you have to get a permission slip from all the parents to let, you, let them know. We're talking about this topic. Um, that way you don't get in trouble as the pastor. All right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as we talk about this, Jesus is going to have some very, very serious words. Um, the follow-up next week, we're going to look at what Jesus says about divorce and why he takes these topics so seriously. So, hopefully we can handle it um, the way Jesus wants us to and handle it with grace and wisdom. So, I want to start with a quote from D.A. Carson. He's an incredibly prolific author and theologian, especially in uh, the Greek language in the New Testament. <clears throat> he says this, We are to deal drastically with sin. We must not pamper it, flirt with it, enjoy nibbling a little of it around the edges. We are to hate it, crush it, dig it out. Sin leads to hell. And that is the ultimate reason why sin must be taken seriously. All right, so Jesus is going to have some very intense words this morning in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, we tend to, in our culture, have softened a lot of the things that the Bible says, of like, oh, that's too mean, or that's too strict, or that's too restricting, and things like that. Um, but there is a reason the, that Jesus is so serious, and it's because God takes sin seriously. All right, so the ultimate image of how serious sin is to God is the cross itself, right? So if you want to think about how serious is my sin, how serious is humanity's sin in terms of rebellion against God and His ways, yes, as Christians, we look at the cross with thanksgiving and, and rejoicing that He went there. But the flip side of that is this is how serious God takes sin and how God decided that he must deal with it is his son dying on the cross, all right? So we, we can't just wiggle out of it and be like, oh, well, this sounds kind of mean, or this sounds kind of harsh or extreme. So, and, and what I love about this quote from D.A. Carson, it's a wonderful warning of just what we are to do with our sin as Christians. That, you know, Martin Luther, the first of his 95 theses is that, the, the life of a Christian is to be one of repentance. We always need to be killing our sin, turning away from our sin, and by God's grace, turning back to Him. All right, so a few Bible verses from the Old Testament, adultery, because Jesus in the Sermon Mount is picking up off of the Old Testament and then kind of expounding upon it. These are sermons. All right, so Exodus 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. There it is. It's in the Ten Commandments. Um, in case you forget the Ten Commandments, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, they're repeated again. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 18, you shall not commit adultery. And in Leviticus 20, verse 10, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. All right, so this is God puts this in the Ten Commandments. It's a very extreme law, and then we see the extreme consequences for that sin laid out by God. The right? reason I'm sharing the Leviticus 21, we're going to talk about a story with Jesus and adultery later on. All right, <clears throat> so verse 27 of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Right. So there it is. He's quoting God's law from the Old Testament. And in verse 28, But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to desire her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Some translators say whoever looks at her with lust in his heart or lust in his eyes. There's different ways of translating this. So one of the things that Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount and that he's doing again here in Matthew 5, verse 27, 28, is that he takes the law of God from just what are my outward actions right, to what's going on in my actual heart. And so he does this throughout the Sermon on the Mount. We've seen him do it a few times already. In the future passages, he's going to do it again with other laws from the Old Testament. So for Jesus, he's explaining and teaching to his followers 
that in order to actually be righteous, to actually obey God's law, you have to go beyond just what is happening with your outward actions, right? It has to be having a pure heart, a righteous heart. And he's also bringing this up every time because one of the things that was very common in their world at that time were the Pharisees and how the Pharisees were thought of as being super righteous, being incredibly obedient to God because they had these wonderful outward appearances of wonderful obedience to God's rules and God's ways. And Jesus' point is, I want to know what's going on with your heart. Okay, so Jesus is walking us through all kinds of different laws that God has given to us and then revealing to us essentially you're not going to pull it off. <laughs> okay. So in case you're ever in danger of going, I'm doing really good. Jesus is like, yeah, well, what about your heart? You're like, wow, do we have to talk about that? Like, So uh, another example, Jesus will talk about anger and murder, right? We talked about that. We all talked about it. We all confessed that we love getting angry, okay? <laughs> so Jesus says, well, you haven't murdered anybody. You're like, see, I didn't kill them. I didn't, I didn't harm them. He's like, yeah, but did you have anger in your heart and like ill intent in your heart and want to see bad things for them? You're like, yeah, I did. <laughs> well, now, according to Jesus, you're guilty, right? So he's doing the same thing with sexuality, with lust. It's not just, did I refrain from doing some physical act? For Jesus, it's what is going on in your heart. All right, so... In Proverbs chapter 6, uh, Proverbs has wonderful passages all about different aspects of life. And it talks about lust and relationships. And Proverbs chapter 6 says this, Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. And the later on in Proverbs 6, He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. Now, we all, from just a human level, it's very obvious to see what happens to a human relationship when that trust or those kinds of acts are committed, right? Everybody can see the destruction and the pain. The reason I bring up these Proverbs passages is because trying to connect it to what Jesus does, which he connects it to the heart. And so sometimes we think we're getting away with sin or sin isn't that bad or that harmful if it's only like only I know about it, if it's only in my heart. And Proverbs says he who commits adultery lacks sense. Yes, that's funny. It's like, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. That was sinful. It was foolish. But the second half of the verse is, he who does it destroys himself. Now, we could look at it and go, well, you wrecked that relationship and that relationship. We can understand that there's other people that are harmed, right? But here's the deal. He's saying, no, you, you're, you're also destroying yourself. Sin is always destructive. All right. Uh, one uh, theologian I heard put it this way. He said, um, sin can be personal, but it's never private. Meaning that your sin, even if you're trying to, it's just me, it's just in my heart, it's just in my mind. Since sin always destroys us and corrupts us, it will eventually impact your other relationships. People might not know specifically why or what's going on, but it will spill over, right? And so when Jesus says, it's not just your actions, you're like, well, I didn't hurt anybody. It's just in my head. It's just in my heart. Uh, this proverb is a powerful reminder of, no, you're actually destroying yourself. Like, you're sinning in your heart. Like, on the inside, you're becoming uglier. You're becoming more corrupt. It, it is going to affect you. It will eventually affect other people. All right. So, <clears throat> Jesus says, if uh, whoever looks at a woman, so just look around the room for a second, and look at a woman. Oh! Right? No. <laughs> We have to understand how to interpret what Jesus is saying. This is not like, just go around like, I'm sorry, ladies. <laughs> Can't. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. I put in your handout, in quotes, keeps on looking. Because this is, 
It's a participle in the Greek. You're welcome for grammar lessons, okay? Uh, this is an active thing that's ongoing. And we kind of understand that that makes a difference, right? It's not just like, I made eye contact, hug, oh no. All right, it's, this keeps on looking, right? It's, it's this desirous gaze, and then you begin sinning in your head or in your heart, right? So uh, Dr. Danny Aiken, who wrote a wonderful commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, he says it this way he's about this word that keeps on looking. He says, the gaze excites sexual imaginations in the heart, and you mentally engage in an act reserved for your spouse in the marriage bed. All right. This is what Jesus is getting at. He's not just like, you have eyeballs. You're going to see other humans. All right. Sometimes you're going to be physically attracted to other humans and go, wow, that's a pretty person. All right. That doesn't mean you're like, that's it. I'm in trouble. Right. It's Jesus saying, like, that keeps on looking. It's this desirous gaze that goes further than it should. Right. Um, <clears throat> so Jesus is going to begin taking this incredibly seriously in the next couple verses all right and i want to share um Dockery and garland they're both named david which is convenient for my footnotes um <laughs> uh, wrote a book called seeking the kingdom and it's based on the sermon on the mount and seeking god's kingdom and they were talking about this section about lust and they say lust treats other persons as things to be exploited it adulterates them when the lust is sated the object of the lust is discarded, and another object is sought out. So when we get to why Jesus takes this so seriously, is because on a human level, lust begins to degrade other human beings from people created in God's image to objects meant to just satisfy a quick need of, or desire of mine, and then to be quickly discarded as nothing more. All right. And Jesus, just so you know, loves people. He loves the people who have been created in his image that he came to redeem. So he's going to take it very seriously when our sin begins to treat them as less than that. Right? When we remove their <coughs> dignity and begin to treat them as objects meant to just fulfill some almost animalistic desire in me. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have these serious words. Jesus says, if you, if you do this, if you gaze like this, you have committed adultery. So even the people that were hearing this, they were like, well, I've never done anything with anyone other than my spouse. Jesus is like, you're all guilty because you have sinful hearts. All right? it's, again, Jesus is bringing it back not just to our outward actions, but our inner hearts and minds. All right, <clears throat> he goes on. In verse 29, this is where it gets real extreme, y'all. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell. So how many of you, you know, have ever sinned with your eyes? Anybody? And how many of you plucked it out because you were being obedient to Jesus? Now, how many of you think this is, sounds really extreme? You're like, oh, okay. I mean, sin's serious, Lord, right? But that sounds a bit much. All right, we're going to talk about this and why he chooses eyes. All right. Uh, so, Job 31, verse 1, Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Right, he, he's made this covenant because if you don't know the story of Job, everything's gone wrong in his life. And then his idiot friends come along to try to explain why everything's going wrong in his life. And one of the accusations is, well, maybe you've lived sinfully. And Job's like, I made a covenant with my eyes. Like, I, I've never done that. Okay. So Jesus is picking up on this idea throughout the Old Testament that your eyes are kind of, they're metaphors for things that you are desiring or lusting after, whether it's another human, a, a position, a possession, things like that, okay? And so this is why Job is like, well, I made a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to do that, all right? So <clears throat> he, I wanna, before we get back to the eyes, talk about a couple words that Jesus uses. So he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, all right? So that phrase, causes you to sin, 
can also be translated as causes you to stumble. All right, so if you think about we are following Jesus, the Bible uses this image of following Jesus is you're, you're walking in his steps. All right, that's a very common image in the New Testament. I'm walking in his steps. Anybody ever been walking around and tripped on a Lego? <laughs> or anything else or you stubbed your toe and you think lord just take me now <laughs> um right we, we have this understanding that like when i'm going along there's times where i can stumble along the path right i can get off track i can fall down and it causes pain it causes harm to myself so Jesus is using this imagery, and the word here is actually scandalon. That's your Greek words where we get the English word scandalous from, or scandalize. This is actually the word Jesus uses to describe his ministry when he's talking to John the Baptist. He says to John the Baptist, Blessed are you and anyone who is not scandalized by what I teach and what I do. Right? Which means, blessed is anybody who doesn't stumble because of Christ's witness and his ministry. Which is what... A lot of people in the New Testament did. They, they couldn't get over who he was or what he was saying, right? So he's saying it, the same thing for us. And I think, for me, it's a better uh, word picture to understand what Jesus is talking about. Like, oh, cause you to sin. Oh, okay. But to think about, like, I'm a disciple of Jesus. I'm following in his footsteps. I'm following where he leads me, wants me to go. But this thing keeps causing me to stumble along the path. It's causing me harm. It's slowing me down, causing other people Harm, right? So that's the picture that Jesus is saying. So <clears throat> he wants us to destroy, cut off anything that causes me to stumble to sin in life. Now, if you do literally what Jesus says, for most human beings, there's going to be nothing left in your life, right? Because it might not, you're like, well, I'm, lust isn't my thing. Okay, well, pick your thing. Okay, because every human being has some something, some idol, some something that causes you to stumble along the pathway, right? And Jesus is saying, here's how seriously you should take it. Cut it off, get rid of it, destroy it, because it's better for you to lose that thing now than to not receive eternal life. Now, another way you have heard this that is probably more familiar to your memory is when Jesus famously says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Anybody heard that? That's what this is. He's saying, what, what does it profit you? you? You gained that idol, right? You gained that moment of lust, that moment of pleasure. What did it gain you, though? Because now you're stumbling into sin and you're forfeiting the eternal life that I'm offering you. Now, when we sit in Sunday school, <laughs> and we got our Bibles out, and we're all ready to be on Team Jesus, it's really easy, right, to go, well, of why would you out? It's black and white, right? It's very simple. Until you get into the real world in your real life, and you realize, but there's like a lot of stuff I got to get out, <laughs> get rid of. Right? I got to throw away everything. I got I got body parts that probably should get go, okay? <laughs> all right. <laughs> You're like, if I take this to the fullest extent, you're like, there's nothing left. All right. So that's what Jesus says about our eyes. I want a couple more word, a couple more things about eyes. Why does Jesus pick up eyes? And then we're going to get to the part where you're supposed to cut off your hand. Okay. If you thought eyes, that's extreme. Jesus like goes even further. All right. So Sinclair Ferguson is a, is a theologian and his commentary on these words from Jesus is this. He says, act decisively, immediately, even if it is painful. The drastic nature of the remedy is simply the index of the radical danger of the sin. It is not a situation for negotiation. All right, so what he's saying is, these words from Jesus sound incredibly extreme. And the reason is because he, Jesus wants you and I to understand how extremely destructive our sin really is. Right? We often fall into the devil's thinking of our sin is really not that big of a deal. I can handle it. Anybody ever tried to fix yourself? Done that commentary with God? Like, oh, yeah, I know I'm, I'm forgiven, Lord. 
Or maybe you don't actually confess it because you want to take care of it and fix it before you go to Jesus for healing. We do that a lot too. Right? And so we go, man, these words from Jesus are, and they are very extreme. Pluck your eye out. The next verse I'm going to read to you says, chop your hand off. All right. And he's trying to show us through these images, here's how extremely dangerous and destructive your sin really is. And I, I, I love Sinclair's Ferguson's phrase, it's not a situation for negotiation. <laughs> Wait, Lord, maybe only take a finger and then I'll, take, I'll handle the rest. Right? It's not, we, we are so sinful. We are so, this is what Luther and John Calvin called total depravity, meaning uh, you're just corrupt. We're sinful. I, I love you all. I love this church. You're wonderful people. You're also horribly depraved sinners, all right? And so am I, okay? <laughs> we are all like this. And a lot of times we ignore that. It's not as bad. But no, it really is that bad. It really is <laughs> destructive. And the only way to cure it is to destroy that sin. Now, we know the good news of the gospel is that my sin is ultimately destroyed on the cross. That, that's where it's destroyed. It's not me just being like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, not lust today. I'm just not going to get angry. I'm just not going to lash out or whatever your thing is, right? Good luck. I mean, that's wonderful intentions. But you can't negotiate with your sin. You're, you're not going to get your sin under control. You have two options with sin. Either kill it and destroy it on the cross or let it rule over you. And this is the language Paul uses in Romans where he says you're either a slave to sin which means it's your master, or your what? And you remember, a slave to righteousness because of the cross. Paul is saying, you and I as humans have two options to be ruled by. We are either ruled by sin or we're ruled by Christ's righteousness. There's no this in-between of, I'm sort of good on some days, and you know, I'm working on it, I'm, right? I'm a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. But now when it comes to sin, we've got to destroy it. All right. <clears throat> So, Genesis 3, verse 6, um, this is the passage of Eve committing the first sin. All right, and it's been downhill ever since for humanity. So, she eats the fruit. Remember this story? The devil comes along as a serpent. He tricks her um, before you beat up all the women. Just so you know, if you read it in Hebrew, Adam is standing right next to her listening to the whole conversation. And Adam doesn't speak up or intervene or do his job that God had told him to do. All right. So they're both terrible. That's my point. If you're a guy, you're a terrible sinner. If you're a woman, you're a terrible sinner. Good for us. All right. Eve is standing there. She's looking at the fruit. The devil's saying, isn't it delicious? Isn't it wonderful? You'll become like God. And then in... Genesis 3, verse 6, it says, When the woman, when Eve saw that it was desirous or delightful for learning or for knowledge or wisdom, depending on your English translation because it's kind of tricky, she took it and ate it, right? Now, I wrote down a Hebrew word for you, along with Greek. I gave you two. That's pretty good, right? Tawa or tava, depending on how you want to say it, if you like W's or V's. It doesn't really matter. All right. This is the Hebrew word describing Eve's eyes. Now, our English translations are pretty bad. We say, oh, she saw that it was desirous or delightful. Um, what it really means, this word tava, is like she's lusting at it with her eyes. Her eyes saw it and became basically consumed with it. Of Like, I must get this thing. I must get this object. Now, this word is used throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament to talk about sinners desiring different kinds of sins, God desiring to save his people. All right, so what it is, is it's a, basically it's this all-consuming desire that I won't be satisfied until I have it. But the other point of this story is that it's described as it's coming, that the lust for that fruit that desire for that fruit is coming from her eyes, right? She sees that it's appealing. And this is why Jesus, when he's talking about lusting after other humans, 
which we're not supposed to do, describes our eyes, right? He's saying that's where it begins. You see something, you see an idol, you see a position, you see someone else succeeding, you get jealous or whatever it is, and then you begin to what? Lust, desire, obsess over and say, I will not be satisfied until I get that thing or that relationship or whatever it might be. All right, so again, it comes from our eyes. All right, next verse. Jesus says, you know, pluck your eye out, throw it away. It's better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell, right? So it's, it's better to lose your idols here and now to give up those things that you lust after and desire here and now than to suffer the consequences of sin for all eternity. Verse 30 says, If your right hand causes you to sin, you know, some of you are like, good thing I'm left-handed. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Cut it off and throw it away. So how many of us have done that yet? Okay. It is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body go into hell. Now we talked about how to understand what Jesus is getting at here. All right. So there are some passages in your Bible. When we take a whole class at seminary on this called hermeneutics. All right. All about how to properly interpret passages. Some passages in your Bible you're supposed to take literally and do exactly what it says. Good example. The Ten Commandments. Now. You and I are sinners, so we don't pull it off, but we understand that like when God says to do that, you're like, go do that. Other passages are using images or metaphors to make a point, not necessarily Jesus wanting us to all walk around plucking our eyeballs out and chopping off body parts that cause us to sin. Right? <laughs> he is showing us, here is the extreme danger and consequence of your sin. Rather than us treating it as like a little play thing or something I can handle, he's saying, no, it will destroy you. If you end up loving your sin more than me, it will destroy you. So get rid of it. Cut off whatever is destroying you so you can have life in Jesus. All right. Now, not everybody got that. There's a guy named Origen. He's a church father. Um, he's an interesting guy. Some of his stuff is really helpful in terms of understanding early church things, understanding the Trinity, and things like that. Other of his things got a little weird. Origen took this passage literally. So, he, and we know this because of his journals. All right, so I'm not making this up. You can Google it if you don't believe me. It really happened. Origen took this so seriously that when he was walking along and he began to lust after a woman, he had the practice of stripping off his clothes and jumping into a thorn bush to punish himself and get rid of the lustful, lustful feelings, which I guess in that moment would work because you'd be like distracted by other things. Um, <clears throat> however, Origen came to realize this was not a permanent solution because he still had this problem of lust. So the next step he took was he personally castrated himself. And then later on in his writings and letters, he says, I think I might have misunderstood what Jesus meant. <laughs> uh, he literally, he admitted it. He's like, yeah, I don't think that's what Jesus was getting at. Because um, he continued to struggle with lust. All right. And this is why at the beginning, we've emphasized the theme that Jesus has been carrying throughout the whole Sermon on the Mount, which is, it's not a matter of your outward behavior. It's what's going on in your heart. Right. You could pluck one of my eyes out, and I bet I could find a way to sin with my left eye. Right? You could chop my left right hand off, find a way to sin with my left. And so the issue is, again, for Jesus, not do these extreme things because then you will be perfect. He's trying to point out, I want you to see how extremely dangerous your sin really is for you and for others. And so cut the sin out, cut the idols out so they don't ultimately destroy you. Now this is hard because here's the reality. You love your idols and so do I. That's why you make them and that's why you pursue them. And now when we are convicted of the Holy Spirit, we hate them and we 
we confess them and we destroy them, we repent. But here's the reality is because we are sinful, we, we continue to go back to them. Uh, John Calvin, one of my heroes, uh, said the human heart is nothing more than an idol factory. I destroy one, and then it's like, tink, 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 oh, here's, another, here's a whole new one. I never even knew I wanted it. All right. And Jesus is saying, it might hurt because you love that idol. You, you desire that idol. So, yeah, it will, it will hurt. It will sting. There might be some consequences. People might find out that you are a sinner. And for a lot of us, that's terrifying. And I don't mean in the general sense, like, ah, oh, I passed and we're all sinners. But I mean, they might find out you struggle with that sin or that idol. And that could be painful. You see Jesus saying, yeah, but it leads to life. If you keep holding on to that idol, guess what's going to happen? It's going to lead to death. So dying a little bit now, picking up your cross every day and dying to yourself now, but receiving eternal life later is better. Does that make sense? All right. So Jesus has these extreme words about adultery, about lust, about sin. Um, John Owen, he's a Puritan theologian and preacher. He was. He died like a really long time ago. Um, he famously said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. All right, we got to take our sin. As Colossians says, it's all been nailed to the cross. So that's what confession and repentance is all about. It's killing my sin by nailing it to the cross of Jesus and saying, it doesn't rule me anymore. It's not my master anymore. I belong to Christ. All right, so to show you the gracious side of Jesus beyond the, oh, you lusted? Okay, well, start chopping things off. Um, what is Jesus, how does he respond to us when we are sinners caught in our sin? All right, so I want you to turn to John 8, um, starting in verse 1. Now, this is the story of, it's usually called, a woman caught in adultery, which has to be one of the worst subheading titles for a story ever. Because you can't just be one person caught in adultery. Like, I don't want to have the birds and the bees talks with y'all right now, but that usually takes at least two human beings. But they only bring the woman out. We're going to talk about this story. Now, <clears throat> there's a very, very famous story. Lots of people I know tell me it's their favorite story in the Bible because Jesus shows so much compassion and kindness to a person that is utterly destroyed by their sin, utterly humiliated by it, right? So, one of the most famous parts of this story is Jesus begins doodling in the ground, and what's the response of the crowd when he starts drawing in the ground? Anybody remember? They start leaving, right? They, he starts writing, and all they do is start putting their stones down and walking away, right? Now, to add some context to this, I'm going to tell you, if you've ever wondered what the heck he was writing, I'm going to tell you the answer. We know the answer. Stop listening to the sermons where they just make stuff up. Right? The Bible tells you the answers. That's my whole spiel. All right. This is at the end of the festival of booths or tabernacles or Sukkot, whatever name you want to call it. All right. So the Feast of Booze, the Feast of Tabernacles, is what happens in John 7. Jesus goes to the festival at the very end, and he begins to do some teaching. The Pharisees don't like this. They go back and forth. A bunch of mean things are said to him. On the last day of the festival, Jesus makes one of, if you don't know, John has seven, and if you want to be really... In, Tricky, you can say eight. Most theologians say eight, but it's hidden. Anyway, the seven I am statements of Jesus, have you ever heard of those? Okay, those are in John. He has seven different sermons where he says I am, and then he fills in the blank, and it's a connection to the Old Testament. It's basically him revealing I'm God. Okay, in John 7, he says, I am living water. Right? Whoever comes to me will never thirst, and those who come to me and receive what I give to them streams of living water will flow out of their heart. Okay? That's the last day of the festival, and Jesus, which was the biggest, 
most important day of the festival. And Jesus stands up in public and gives a sermon and stands in front of everybody and says, I am living water. Okay. You need to remember that for the John 8 story. Now, why does this woman get caught in adultery? Well, first of all, they should have dragged the man out, but they didn't, and that's a whole other issue. All right. The festival of booths or tabernacles or Sukkot is a huge, huge celebration in Jerusalem. Okay, it's one of the three pilgrimage festivals. Everybody would come from everywhere to have this party. Um, it's like Thanksgiving and New Year's all combined. It's just a huge celebration of God giving them a harvest and providing for them and then looking forward to the fact that God will provide for us in the future. Okay? It's a seven-day long party where everybody makes their own tent and they all camp out and hang out. So, if you're at a seven-day long party with a bunch of tents and a bunch of wine drinking and a bunch of celebrating, well, sometimes you might end up in the wrong tent. Right? And that's what happened to this woman. And man, so I've seen people talk about it as if like, oh, she was a known harlot in the city or the town. It's like, no, she was just in the wrong tent. Okay, there was a huge party. There was too much wine. She was in the wrong dude's tent, and he was with the wrong woman. All right. This is why they're able to drag her out in front of everybody, because it's not like, come out of the house. or It's like people saw her go in the tent, and then, oh, does that make sense? better sense now they drag her out at the end of the festival and here's the encounter right but jesus uh, went to the mount of olives early in the morning he came to the temple courts again all the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them the experts of the law and the pharisees so the we don't sit on the outside folks come to jesus to judge somebody right which was the whole Sermon on the Mount is about what? It's going on in your heart, okay? So the experts in the law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught committing adultery. And again, I don't know why they don't bring the man, but whatever. They made her stand in front of them and said to Jesus, now just picture how utterly embarrassing and humiliating this would be. How many of you want to be publicly caught in your deepest, darkest secret sin? All right? Like next church service, I just call you out by name and be like, come on down. We're going to talk about it. Like, I bet I'd never see you again. <laughs> or I'd be fired. One of the two. Something's happening. All right. So just think for a moment how humiliating and undignified this moment is for this woman. To be here is your worst, deepest, darkest moment of shame and guilt. And we're bringing you in front of everybody in the temple, in a church service, essentially. We're going to let everybody know about it. All right. In the law, because by the way, the whole point of this is they're using the woman as an object to just trap Jesus. They don't actually care about her or her sin or her redemption. It's just we're going to use her to trick Jesus. All right. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone to death such women. That's not what the Bible said. Earlier, on your handout, what did I share with you? Leviticus 20. So the law of Moses says, If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So what does God's law say? Yes, it's an extreme penalty for adultery, but it's both, right? It's not just the woman. It was also the man who committed the adultery, right? So they're misquoting the Bible, which is a bad idea to do in front of Jesus. All right. What then do you say? Now, this is a big moment. There's a huge crowd listening to Jesus. This dramatic thing happens in the middle of the church service. What do you say, Jesus? And in verse 6, John gives us some clues. He says, Now they were seeking this in an attempt to trap him so that they could bring charges against him. So John reveals for us they didn't have any like good intent in their hearts whatsoever. They didn't care about God's word or God's law. They just wanted to trap Jesus. All right. So, what do you say, Jesus? Now, imagine this. This is the part where Jesus starts right in the dirt. You come up to me after church, after Bible class, say, Pastor, I got a theological question for you. And you go, what do you think, Pastor? 
And instead of answering you, I take my marker and I just start doodling on the floor. How many of you can be like, that's totally cool. That's what I wanted him to do. <laughs> How many of you can be like, pastors get really weird, right? It would be awkward. You'd just be like, what's going on? Why? What are you doing, man? <laughs> Answer my question. So here, what do you think, Jesus? Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. When they persisted in asking him, he stood up straight and replied, whoever among you is guiltless or without the first sin, depending on what you grew up with, may be the first to throw in a stone at her. Then he bent over again and started running around. Like, just, this would be weird if I did this to you, right? You're like, oh, yeah, well, one idea is this. And then they start drawing again. You're like, our pastor has lost his mind. Okay, I'm not going to do it. Because this isn't dirt. You have to have dirt to have the full effect. Okay? <laughs> if we're outside, maybe. All right. <clears throat> then he bent over again and wrote on the ground. Now when they heard this and saw this, they began to drift away one at a time, starting with the older ones, until Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. So what did Jesus write that shifted their hearts to walk away? Well, the answer is in your Bible. In Jeremiah 17, verse 13. <clears throat> Jeremiah 17, verse 13. says this, You are the one in whom Israel may find hope. All who leave you will suffer shame. Those who turn away from you will have their names written in dust. All right. So those who turn away from God, those who turn away from his path, will have their names written in dust. Now, I told you, in John 7, Jesus stands up and says, I am living water. What is dirt without water? It's, it's dust, right? So these people are treating this woman like an object, rather than someone to be redeemed. Right? They aren't obeying God's law because they don't bring out the man, and they don't fully quote scripture, they misquote it. And they're doing it with solely the intention of trapping Jesus. And he bends down and he starts writing. Now, I don't know for sure if he wrote down their names, or if he just started writing what Jeremiah said, okay? Um, but this passage from Jeremiah was part of the liturgy during the Festival of Booths. And it was talked and would have been taught about every year to remind the people that God is the one who gives us life and provides for us with his water. And if we don't follow him, we have dust and we're written in dust. But if we follow him, he will give us water, and he will give us life. Now, this was also a play on the fact that this was a harvest festival, so they were looking forward to the rainy season coming to provide for them. But the rabbis over time made it spiritual and said, also. And then what happens on the last day? Jesus gets up and says, by the way, I'm that living water. If you come to me, I'll give you water that will flow out of your heart and give you life. So when these men, immediately after that message from Jesus stand in front of him and are like, what do you think? And then he begins to write something down in the dirt. <laughs> he's either writing their names or he's writing from Jeremiah 17. And they all begin to realize we've lost our way. Right? We aren't living in the way of God. Now, this also fits with what Jesus teaches throughout the Gospels when he talks about how God desires mercy and not sacrifice. So they all walk away, and you end up with just Jesus and the woman. So verse 10, Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She replied, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. All right, so he tells her, I'm not here to condemn you. John 
I know you all know it because you told me in church earlier. John 3.17 is also in your Bible. <laughs> and Jesus in that verse says, The Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but to redeem it. So you and I are sinners. And sometimes we're going to get caught in the act and we're going to be publicly humiliated and it's going to be just feel like utter destruction for like this woman. The response of Jesus is, I didn't come to condemn you. I came to redeem you. And then he says, go and sin no more. And this is what the Christian life is. That Jesus comes, he forgives us in the middle of our sin while we're caught in it. Right? Romans Paul says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and redeemed us. And then later on in Romans, he says, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is now therefore no condemnation. So we're not condemned. We're not sentenced to death in our sin anymore because of Jesus. But then because of Jesus, because of the new life he gives to us, we begin to follow his ways. We, We are set free to live differently now out of his grace. Does that make sense? All right. So sometimes, yeah, there's things you're going to have to cut out of your life. Because there's some sins, this side of heaven, you're never, you're just not going to be able to beat. You just got to kill it. Um, I do want to close with one story from C.S. Lewis, who's, well, he's probably my favorite author. ever. He wrote a book. He wrote a lot of books. One's called The Great Divorce. I don't know if anybody's ever read The Great Divorce or read it. It is all about heaven and hell and sin. And in this story of the great divorce, there's this guy that goes on a bus ride between hell and purgatory in heaven. C.S. Lewis believed in purgatory. Deal with it. Okay, like, I know it's not there, but okay, it's just a novel. Okay, guys? Uh, <laughs> uh, and as they're riding around, all kinds of different people get on and off the bus. And eventually there's a guy who, who acts as a guide and begins talking to the narrator about who's getting on and who's getting off. And the whole point is that some people um, stay stuck either in hell or purgatory because they choose it. Because they, everybody's got something on their shoulder in this story, and that represents the thing that they lost after the most in life, the thing that they want, the biggest idol in their life. And so the whole point is that some people choose to not get off the bus in heaven but choose to get off the bus in hell because they don't want to let it go. They love it more than they love God. And at one point, <clears throat> the ending of the story is that there's a woman who gets on the bus. And um, for her, her, her child died early on in life. And she basically says, well, I can't love anything else in all existence more than him. And so even though <clears throat> one of the spirits tells her, if you let it go, if you let that idolatry of your family member go and you get to heaven, you'll have a new life and he'll be there with you too. Like God will restore it all. And her response is, I can't let it go. So she ends up choosing to get off the bus somewhere, not in heaven, but in hell. And then there's a man <clears throat> who has a, I don't know why, see this lizard chose it. He has a lizard on his shoulder. Don't know why. Um, <laughs> And the lizard represents lust. And his whole life, he was a sexual deviant, committed adultery, all kinds of things. And he ends up being able to get off the bus in heaven because he allows one of the spirits to kill the lizard that represents his lust. He kills his lust and he lets it go. And even though he had lived his whole life as this horrible person, he gets into heaven because his sin was killed on his behalf. And this is what Jesus is talking about, that um, he is offering you and I eternal life. And we all have, whether it's lust, adultery, or whatever else it is, things that cause us to stumble. Things that we don't like using the word idols, but they're idols. And they're things that you actually love. You, You want your idol. Okay, I want my idols. And Jesus is saying, yeah, even though it might be painful to let it go here and now, it leads to a better path. It leads to eternal life. But if I keep holding on my idol, I keep pursuing that path, it's going to lead to destruction. 